The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Monica Newcomb with the U.S. Department of Energy Better Buildings Initiative. I'd like to welcome you to the June edition of the Better Buildings webinar series. In this series, we will profile the best practices of Better Buildings Challenge, Alliance and Accelerator Partners, and other organizations working to improve energy efficiency in buildings. So thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to take a bit of a different approach and share the results of three successfully completed Better Buildings Accelerators. Each of the presenters will highlight the tools that were created to support partners with their projects, and we hope you will also find these helpful for your work. One of my roles in the Better Buildings program is to coordinate across all the accelerators, so I've had the privilege of working, working with, with each of the presenters that will be providing information on the progress of their efforts today. So let me introduce the presenters. Uh, the first presenter will be Alice Dashek. And in her seven years with the U.S. Department of Energy, Alice has held multiple roles as part of the Partnerships and Technical Assistance Team in support of better buildings. From 2014 to 2016, Alice led an accelerator focused on energy savings performance contracting, or ESPCs, in which she supported 25 state and local governments execute two billion of PC contracts over three years. And she currently is managing another accelerator focusing on wastewater and working with states and facilities on that effort. Alice graduated cum laude from Bryn Mawr College and has master's degrees in business administration and environmental and energy management from the George Washington University. We also have Andrew Burr speaking and he is a policy advisor here at the Department of Energy for the Energy for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Andrew co-leads DOE's Better Communities Alliance, a collaboration with local government leaders, businesses, and institutions to improve the prosperity of American communities through energy technologies and solutions. Prior to DOE, he launched and directed Strategy for the City Energy Project, a 20 million energy efficiency initiative supporting major U.S. cities. Andrew has been quoted by national media, including the New York Times, USA Today, and Governing Magazine, and has presented on U.S. clean energy policy in China and Europe. And our third presenter is Crystal McDonald, a policy advisor in the Weatherization and inter Intergovernmental Programs here at DOE. Her primary role is to identify, prioritize, and accelerate the adoption of policies and practices that transform markets targeted by states and local government initiatives. Crystal supports strategies and programs programs that develop sustainable communities, install clean energy technologies, and reduce costs. Currently, she is the DOE lead, working with the Better Buildings partners in the K-12 education sector, and uh, was also the lead for the Outdoor Lighting Accelerator, which she will speak about today. Crystal has a Master's of Energy and Environmental Management from the George Washington University and a Bachelor's of Science and Architectural Engineering from North Carolina A&T State University. So a really great wealth of knowledge and really excited about hearing the updates they have to provide on the accelerators today. Uh, so right now, you know, I went through and introduced the presenters and we have a lot of you um, on the phone today, um, over 100, so we don't have time to go through for introductions, but just to get a quick sense of who is participating in this webinar, I'd like to go ahead and launch a poll um, just if, if you could identify the category which best describes the sector you represent. And we only have five options. So we have public sector, private sector, nonprofit, academic sector, utility industry, or other. Um, so I see the answers are coming in. Thank you for providing a quick response here. We'll give about five more seconds and then share the results. Okay, great. So at this point, I'm going to close the poll. And it looks like uh, the majority of you are public sector at 52%, 20% from the private sector, you know, about 17% from nonprofit academic, a few of you from industry, and then, sorry, a few of you from other that we weren't able to include um, as in a category. 
Uh, before we start our presentation, just re want to remind you of a few items. Um, one, you are all muted today because of the large number, but we really welcome your questions and feedback. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box throughout the um, sessions or the presentations. Today we're going to pause after each presentation because they're on different topics and we'll address questions for each of the presenters as we go along. Um, we'll also have a few other polls just to try to get your feedback as, as we move along. Um, also just wanted to note that this session will be archived and posted to the web for your reference. Um, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and get, get going. I'm going to start with a quick summary of the Better Buildings Accelerators, and then we'll move into the deep dive of the presentations and information on the three accelerators we're going to be talking about today. So if we could advance the slide. Um, and to the next one, there we go. So just a quick note about the Better Buildings Initiative. Uh, DOE partners with leaders in the public and private sectors to make the nation's homes, commercial buildings, and industrial plants more energy efficient by accelerating investment and sharing of successful best practices. As you can see, I don't, if you, I don't know, Britt, if you can go back to that slide before. In the puzzle graphic, we have four different pillars um, for the Better Buildings Program, market leadership, better information, workforce development, and federal, federal and community leadership. And as you can see over here in the box to the right, the Better Buildings Accelerator fit under the market leadership because it's a partnership program where we're directly working with you know, public private sector partners to work through challenges. So to the next slide, we can speak a little bit about the way the accelerators work. First, just want to note that these are voluntary efforts. Um, really, the purpose of the accelerators are to de develop collaborative peer-to-peer -peer networks where we can share learning um, and provide essentially a framework to um, you know, add some additional technical assistance from the Department of Energy and resources to help um, the partners we're working with um, work through some issues or challenges so that then they can accelerate their progress. Um, each of the accelerators are issue specific. They are, they are focused with a specific topic in mind and identified obstacles that we are working to overcome as a group. Um, they are also time bound. We typically have these to be a two to three year time frame. Really we want to be very focused with the obstacles we're working to solve and then at that point um, we either an effort or sort of transition it more to a longer term DOE program or even an external stakeholder group, if that's a better fit. And then just last, these are definitely results-driven results driven efforts. Each of the partners that participate commit um, to goals with the accelerator, as well as actively participating in the network. And just time again, what I hear from partners, you know, the, the thing that they find actually most beneficial from these um, efforts are the active participate, participation from the other partners and hearing from their peers as well as the technical assistance that Department of Energy can provide through this. So then moving to the next slide, just a quick note here in our numbers, we, we launched the Accelerator platform in 2013. This has proved to be a really powerful way to, to, to work with partners. So we now have over 20, I'm sorry, 200 organizations participating in 13 accelerators. Um, of those 13 accelerators, four are completed with comprehensive toolkits, and you'll hear about three of those today and we have nine active accelerators. And if we go to the next slide, I'm going to just very quickly go through the nine active accelerators, just in case um, you guys are interested potentially in participating in, in any of these. Most of these are still open to align new partners. So quickly, um, we have the Clean Energy for Low-Income Communities effort, and this is working with um, cities, states, and community organizations and utilities to develop programs to increase energy efficiency and solar installments in communities that have low to moderate income residents. Um, the next is the Combined Heat and Power for Resiliency Accelerator. Uh, in this effort, we are working with communities and utilities who are designing resiliency plans and are looking to have different forms of um, you know, distributed generation, uh, with, you know, in particular CHP and perhaps solar and storage to um, basically help keep their critical infrastructure up and running during external events. In the data centers accelerator, we are working to um, you know, make data centers, data centers more efficient. And the commitment there is a 25% reduction um, in one of the data centers by 2019. Um, our home energy information accelerator works with, um, is focused on 
the residential sector, and um, I think this is a really exciting one. It's working to hopefully make um, energy information available in the multiple listing system. So when you go to buy a house, you, you can see energy information. Uh, we also, the, another residential program is the Home Upgrade Program, and this is working with administrators of home energy upgrade programs to streamline uh, systems to make it, you know, more cost effective um, and higher quality. We move to the next slide. All right, so four more other ones here. Four other ones here. Uh, Smart Labs is working with labs across federal agencies, corporations, universities, national laboratories to, once again, increase the efficiency of laboratories. Um, <clears throat> the Wastewater Infrastructure Accelerator is focusing on um, sustainable in infrastructure for the future with wastewater facilities, and that is working with states who then are um, working with local agencies or facilities in their state, um, and partners uh, commit to 30% um, reduction. Um, <clears throat> and then we have two zero energy efforts. One is focused on zero energy districts, and the idea there is really working across, um, you know, a, a set of buildings to maximize, maximize efficiency and then bring in renewable energy um, so you're essentially at, able to meet zero energy goals. And the last one is also zero energy focused. That's working with schools um, to develop zero energy designs um, to, you know, meet, meet zero energy goals for schools. If we move to the next slide. So these are the accelerators that are accomplished, and I'm not going to go into those details because um, that is what Alice and uh, Andrew and Crystal will be uh, doing a deep dive on. So at this point, before we start with um, Alice's presentation, um, we do have two questions related to ESPCs that I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll on. So the first question is, how would you describe your current involvement with ESPCs? And the options are interested in learning more about ESPCs, to starting an ESPC project, interested in developing and expanding my ESP program, or not interested in ESPCs. And we'll give you a few seconds here to provide your feedback. All right, seeing the answers come in. Looks like we have uh, a good majority of people who provided, provided responses. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll at this point and share the results. Uh, so the majority of you, 70%, interested in learning more about ESPCs. A few of you have just started the ESPC project at 4%. Um, some of you are interested in developing or expanding your current program, 22%. And we have a, a few, 5%, not interested in ESPCs. All right, so that's good for Alice to know as she moves forward. Um, and we have actually one other set of questions here on ESPCs. Uh, and for those um, that are interested in ESPCs, if you could describe what challenge you are most concerned about related to ESP implementation. Identifying and selecting the right financing option, developing projects including selecting contractor, conducting measurement and verification, tracking results, providing technical assistance for ESPC, um, or make or marketing the results and benefits for ESPC. And this information will be really helpful because Alice actually, through her work, has, um, with the accelerator, developed great tools around all of these, and she can highlight um, the tools that people are most interested in based on this response. Okay, we'll just I see some responses still coming in. Let's we'll give it five more seconds here, and I'll close the poll. Okay, so the results for this is sort of pretty evenly split, it looks like. 32% interested in financing, 24 in developing projects, 22% in um, tracking, uh, and then tracking results. About 20% interested in technical assistance, and a few of you, 3% in marketing results and benefits of the SBC. 
Okay, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Alice. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for spending part of your afternoon with us today to hear about the great efforts of our state and local partners over the accelerators. And I am particularly excited specifically to talk about the ESPC accelerator, uh, where our state and local partners really, uh, I would call them the unsung heroes. Um, they toiled over three years and really did some innovative and hard work to unlock the potential of energy savings performance contracting, or ESPC, to advance their retrofit projects. So just quickly to bring everyone on the same page, ESPC is a contracting and financing method that provides upfront financing for energy efficiency projects that is then repaid by the savings on utility bills resulting from those upgrades. And DOE sees ESPC as a promising tool to enable your energy efficiency projects. And under ARA began offering some regular assistance to expand access to ESPC. Three years ago then, with that in mind, DOE launched a set of initiatives called the Accelerators and specifically focused one of them on energy savings performance contracting. That was one of the first of the Accelerators. Next slide, please. And next one after that. So today, we will take a look, a quick look at the accelerator. We need to move quickly through it and some of the work that the partners completed to resolve barriers to using ESPC. And from there, we'll move really quickly to the focus of today's discussion, which is a description of the actual toolkit that resulted from that hard work. It's a collection of the barrier resolutions that partners worked on during the three years that then uh, were adapted and generalized to help other state and local governments implement ESPC. Along the way, we'll call out a few of the individual tools and then wrap up by sharing some of the trends that we saw coming out of the accelerator and how DOE plans to continue supporting ESPC into the future. Next slide, please. So this accelerator, like many of the others that Monica pointed out, is was a three-year initiative. It launched um, in December 2013 and ran from January of 2014 until recently concluding at the end of 2016. There were 25 partners, and as you see on the slide here, there were 18 states, six cities, and one school district. And the goal was, uh, as I mentioned, earlier was really to enable ESPC investment and to uh, enable as much access to ESPC as the partners wanted. The goal in the end was to um, enable investment of $2 billion, and I'm very pleased to report that our partners exceeded even that ambitious goal, recording in the end $2.1 billion in ESPC investment in the MUSH market. Next slide, please. And here I've just included a complete list of the partners for your reference. Next slide, please. So in terms of the activities that the accelerator undertook, you can take a look at your leisure at these areas listed here and, and the activities that were um, serving them. But I wanted to draw your attention particularly to the final area, area three, resolving individual ESPC barriers. Each partner elected one barrier to their ESPC investment to work on resolving over an 18-month period during the entire uh, term of the accelerator. And partners received custom, customized peer exchanges. They participated in year-long series of discussion groups and then worked individually with DOE to complete individual barrier solutions. The goal was really to support successful, permanent, innovative and replicable resolution of these individual barriers. And so the solutions were intended to meet the immediate needs that that partner expressed and then also adapt those solutions to help other state and local governments that face the same barriers. Because very often the barriers that were identified by the partners were common in the area of ESPC uh, for state and local governments. So the accelerator then adjusted the solution, once the partner uh, 
made it as unique and specific as possible. And then the accelerator was able to adjust the solutions and the supporting resources to be universally applicable and then make them available to other public organizations uh, in the form of this toolkit. And so they really formed the basis of what is now known as the toolkit combined with a few other uh, significant resources or pieces that we have found to be helpful also to ESPC. Next slide, please. So here, and then Brittany, if you could call up the home page, please. I'd like to show everyone kind of a live shot of what it looks like. So when you go to the link that was listed on that slide, uh, you will see exactly the, the visual that was there. And uh, we will not be able to navigate through it with you today on the webinar just for uh, time sake, but I wanted everyone to see how it's divided into these sections. You, um, just a few words about that structure because it's pretty important. So the other resources that DOE had around ESPC uh, that were beyond the solutions coming out of the accelerator were combined with the resources that came out of the individual partner solutions, and those two sets of resources were combined into one package. And then to make navigation as intuitive as possible and help people locate those resources when they needed them, the structure followed the decision-making process that you follow when you decide whether and how to pursue an energy savings performance contract. So thus you see the categories of when you're considering ESPC, then moving to the right when you're actually implementing a project, then you move down to actually establishing a program to support ESPC as a regular component of your projects, your retrofit projects. Then you might look to expand to new markets with ESPC. And then finally, and very importantly, to evaluate the results of those projects. Next slide, please. We'll go back to the slides. Thank you. And so for a quick run through of the sections, and then we'll take a stop at some of the individual tools, and maybe I can incorporate with uh, some of the responses that you provided. It looks like um, expanding program was probably the second highest after learning more about ESPC. So we'll stop there a little bit later in, when we go to the third section. Uh, and some of these others I'll bring up as they, as they become relevant. So here in the Considering ESPC section, uh, we included resources that help users understand the general legislative and market conditions for ESPC, and then further help them decide whether ESPC is the appropriate vehicle for their specific retrofit. Next slide, please. So the new tool that uh, we're very happy to announce uh, is a brief summary of the elements involved in an energy savings performance contract. And I apologize, it does look blurry when it's blown up to this size. But when you see the slides in real size or go to the website, you'll be able to take a, a good closer look at that. Uh, we had to make the print pretty small to, to fit everything on one page. We wanted a handy dandy kind of one page reference sheet that would summarize all of the elements involved in an energy savings performance contract and the process from the benefits of doing an ESPC project to what is actually required of you at every step of the way. And then importantly, uh, we compared it to what is probably most familiar to um, actors in the public sector would be the standard kind of design bid build approach. And so then readers or users of this sheet can compare the details of implementing a project using ESPC versus designing, uh, versus using, excuse me, design, bid, build, and comparing the benefits of both projects to assess which approach is better suited for the project in question. Next slide, please. The next section is implementing ESPC, and that's helpful once you've actually made the decision to use ESPC for your project. It includes resources that support the specific steps in implementing a single project, like selecting the ESCO or developing the uh, ESPC contract. Next slide, please. 
I'd like to pause at two of the tools in this section. And this gets at uh, one of the responses. Um, about 32% of you were interested in looking at the financing that is available for ESPC. And this new tool helps to identify what options are available and then also to understand what they involve um, when you're trying to use them in an energy savings performance contract. So by answering a series of questions that you see here on the screen, you then arrive at the financing options that appear in the toolkit below the line that you see that says financing. Uh, the whole thing didn't fit here, but this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. By answering those questions, you then arrive at the options that meet the conditions in your particular jurisdiction. Each of the options appears in an individual box, like you see here. And you can click into the individual boxes uh, to see an explanation of the tool, exactly what it is, and then also some of the benefits and considerations that you should know about when deciding whether to use that financing option for your contract. And this arose from the barrier that you see listed here, where several partners in the accelerator actually said, have we actually considered all financing options available to us? They just wanted to make sure that they had covered all of their bases and understood um, what was available, what worked in their particular jurisdiction, and that they had not overlooked any, any particular option. Next slide, please. So this second tool in, in the implementing ESPC section came out of a specific partner's request uh, under the accelerator and as posed on this slide. How can your jurisdiction offer technical assistance for ESPC with limited staff and budget resources? And this also goes back to one of the responses where more than 20% of you were saying that that's something that you're interested in, in looking at, expanding your ESPC program in your jurisdiction. And so the idea here was, with those limited resources, how to overcome those limitations. And so we decided that the best way to overcome both of those limitations at the same time was to take the general assistance services for a, an ESPC project online and then direct project owners to in-person consultations, something that would require a little more detail, a little more discussion, and to offer those in-person consultations at, at limited and very targeted points in the ESPC process. And therefore, you could cover uh, everybody's needs at a more uh, economical level. And so the visual that you see on screen here is the front door, so to speak, of what has become known as the ESPC Virtual Technical Assistant. And so consider it your Siri of ESPC. And when you click into it, uh, you will see the ESPC process for a single project laid out in, in phases, in project phases. And then when you click into each individual phase, you are then taken to a step-by-step -step guide to carrying out the phase, complete with links to other resources or documents that you might need uh, while you implement that particular step in the process. Next slide, please. And so establishing ESPC is our next section, and that really gets at how do you set up a technical assistance program, whether at the state level or some cities have decided to do the same thing, to offer a set of tools or services that support your state or local organizations to um, help them in the jurisdiction utilize ESPC to move projects forward. Next slide, please. And in this section two, I'd like to take a quick look at two of the resources. And on this slide, you see some of the components of what we call the ESPC networking toolkit. We developed this resource in response to the barrier that a partner in the accelerator expressed in, in the question that you see at the top of this slide. And that was namely, how do you establish ESPC as the standard project vehicle? Uh, in our jurisdiction, particularly given that leadership or staff changes and maybe more frequently than is possible to manage when you're uh, talking about a long-term contract like an ESPC. 
So similar to a job search, we recommended uh, that networking was really a good solution. Much like in a job search when you really should keep your contacts informed of your progress at all times, not just when you need something like a job. So the solution here was the same, that the solution to the barrier of keeping ESPC um, supported was that the same approach applied. The components here in this toolkit help you identify the stakeholders that are really critical to establishing that support network for ESPC. And it also provides templates for messaging and communications that help you uh, keep your network uh, informed and to understand the potential of ESPC, and more importantly, the benefits to your state or city uh, once projects are, are completed. So regular communications with that network maintain that support over the long term, even through staff changes. And so it's a very important tool to build and maintain support for ESPC over the long term. Next slide, please. The next tool um, was similar, but addressed a slightly different uh, request. And so I wanted to make sure to cover it in the same presentation, and that is, it also is a toolkit with a set of components where, again, the issue was that there are not very many people, perhaps a low budget, but how do we then go about using ESPC and expanding the use of it to help our projects move forward and then help us really achieve our state energy savings goals or in that uh, city energy savings goals. And so the tools here are, again, pieces that help you identify who champions could be in across your network of, it could be facilities directors, or in the case of the partner that developed this, it could be a set of folks that were already designated as the sustainability coordinators in various agencies. Those folks can then form a network and by providing them with the tools that are available in this toolkit, complete with a uh, really detailed step-by-step -step process of how they can um, remember what, you know, where they should be going and really becoming the advocates for ESPC within their agency. So that is also a very important tool for uh, states or cities looking to expand the use of e ESPC because it requires uh, concentrated and long-term effort of many folks and not just a limited set who sit in a central office. Next slide, please. And uh, one of the last sections, expanding ESPC, is for those who are looking to really apply ESPC in a concerted effort to a specific sector. So very often there are sectors that uh, a state or a city can target to really help them unlock the potential of a particular sector and help them meet the savings goals that that jurisdiction has set. So to date, we have the primer for K through 12 schools, and we have the guide for fleets and fueling infrastructure, which is kind of a nascent area. The ESPC guide for water resource recovery facilities is coming very soon. And then the last, the implementation model that some of you may be familiar with from DOE, talks about expanding ESPC to new markets and really talks about the process that was followed by several partners in the accelerator and provides some of their experience and insights from that experience. Next Alice, slide, just please. a quick time check. I want to make yep. sure we save time for questions and the other presenters too. Oh, sure. I have two slides left. And the last section is about assessing ESPC results, as I mentioned, um, very important important part of the contract process to make sure that uh, you measure and verify the results that are coming out of your ESPC. And then also very important to take those results and, and make sure to promote it and reinforce the value of ESPC for stakeholders in the city or state. Next slide, please. And this last slide uh, really talks about from the experience in the accelerator working with these partners and then putting together the solutions to those common barriers to using ESPC is that 
the state and local ESPC market is, is healthy. There is a lot of growth there, and there is still a lot of opportunity in the broader kind of mush market. There are, of course, still needs in the area of technical assistance, and so these tools are a beginning to that. And we will continue to hear from you, the stakeholders, as well as collaborate with stakeholder organizations to make sure that the toolkit be, remains a living, breathing um, a component and that we will continue to expand it with resources as we hear the need and really expand it. Next slide, please. And here we are at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening today, and I really appreciate sharing this experience with you. Great. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, and as Alice noted, this work builds on the you know previous work for, that we did under the Recovery Act, as well as sort of active work under the State Energy Program, and is just a great set, uh, a collection of information. So I think it can answer a lot of questions under ESPCs. So I encourage you all to check out that website. We're running a little bit short of time, so I think um, I'll look here to answer a question or two, and then I'd like to move to Andrew. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So one question that's just come up. Um, you seem to be assuming that ESPC is the way to go and that the jurisdiction has decided to go that way. Could you go over the pros and cons of ESPC? And oh. that's a really long response, Alice. Um, yeah, it's yeah. long, but I can answer briefly, which is uh, we tried in structuring the toolkit to break it into two sections, which the considering ESPC is before you get to that point, and then the, the resources and tools are really for implementing it once you decide that that's what you're doing. And the, that's why the other sections address the actual implementation. And then okay, for the you know pluses and minuses, you can take a look at that ESPC versus design bid build, which is in the considering section. OK, so we'll take one other question. And I see a few other ones that have come in. And we will address those afterwards. We'll follow up to make sure your questions are answered. Um, we've seen ESPC contracts that are borderline uh, predatory. Any tools to encourage and help, especially smaller units, do technical reviews of these contracts to ensure quality, value, and properly manage expectations to the unit of government? Yeah, so the brief answer is there are probably two resources that to start out with. One is uh, encouraging, we always encourage best practices to have a project facilitator or um, a consultant that helps walk, walk through that and does those technical uh, ass assessments when you're looking at a contract. And the second is uh, to always be aware of your resources at Energy Services Coalition. And then, of course, your state office if there is a program in your state. OK, great. Thanks, Alice. And now we're going to shift direction a little bit. And um, Andrew will share information from the Energy Data Accelerator. Really quickly, we're going to have a poll to um, get your input on uh, that topic. So this question is pretty simple, or quick. Have you had difficulty assessing utility energy info to assess building energy efficiency or conduct an energy efficiency project? No, yes, or I haven't needed that information. Okay, great. I see the results are coming in here pretty quick. Uh, we'll give another 10 seconds. Okay, let me get, can I go ahead and close the poll and we'll share the results. So, um, looks like the majority of you, 50%, say yes, you've had some difficulty with this. Some of you, 35% say no, and then another 15 have really needed that information to date. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Monica. Can you hear me all right? Yes. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Go to the next slide, Britt. Um, so this is the Energy Data Accelerator. We were, uh, like Alice's Accelerator, one of the first ones out of the gate and the first one to close. Um, let me talk for just a moment about the problem that we were trying to solve. As many of you know, real estate owners are measuring and benchmarking the energy performance of their buildings more than ever. 
and in many cases now in 20 cities, states, and counties, there are requirements uh, on industry to benchmark their facilities. Part of what you need to, to do the benchmarking to measure energy performance is information from every energy meter in your building. And this is sort of a counterintuitive problem. You'd think that real estate owners have access to that, but in many cases they don't. So in, in places where there are multiple tenants in buildings and multiple meters, uh, the real estate owner often doesn't have a legal right to access that information, which means, practically speaking, that the owner has a couple options available if they want to benchmark. They need to go to every tenant individually and get them to provide that information, sometimes on a monthly basis. And you can see how this becomes a problem when you have 20 or 30 tenants in an office building or hundreds of residents in a multifamily building, or they need to go to their utility provider and get waiver forms and get each tenant to sign a waiver form. So it's, it's the same type of problem, and it's, it's been a very kind of fundamental structural problem uh, to real estate understanding the basics about how their buildings are performing and then being able to do energy efficiency projects. So uh, about 10 years ago, we did start to see some utilities coming to the table with solutions. Um, one of them is, is Commonwealth Edison in Chicagoland. And what they did is work with their real estate industry to really streamline the process by which an owner with multiple tenants and multiple meters could access that information without having to go to every tenant or without having to go to the utility to uh, get waivers for each tenant. What you see on the screen are our accelerator partners. So what we, what we set out to do was work nationwide with 21 sets of utility city partners to, one, look at the models that have been out there with Comet in Chicago, with National Grid in New York City, with Puget Sound Energy in Seattle, with PEPCO here in Washington, D.C. Look at the models that, that some of the utilities have put out there and then work with other utilities and cities and other stakeholders that want to get to this type of solution um, where there may need to be some evolution to, to these models. Next slide, Britt. This was a two-year accelerator. We started in 2014 and ended at the very beginning of 2016. Um, this is our closeout event on the White House campus. It was a uh, terrific event. We had partners in utilities, cities, and others from all over the country. Next slide, Britt. And we made several announcements there. Um, this was a, a really, really successful accelerator. At the end of it, 18 of the 21 utilities that we were working with uh, had either put in place a data access solution or had committed to do so by this year. And that covers 2.6 million commercial customers. Uh, we published a really thorough and readable that I'll go over briefly. Uh, we worked with the Environmental Protection Agency and their Energy Star Buildings Program. They created a category uh, coming out of this accelerator to reward data innovation and specifically data access innovation. Uh, that first reward, I think a couple months ago, went to the City of Seattle um, with major contributions by their two utilities, Seattle City Light and Puget Sound Energy. And then finally, since our accelerator was our accelerator was ending, uh, we worked with six organizations who committed to continue progress, continue working uh, with real estate, with municipalities and utilities. They're the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, the Institute for Market Transformation, the National Multifamily Housing Council, Natural Resources Defense Council, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which uh, has about a, works with 150 North American cities, and then the U.S. Green Building Council. Next slide, Britt. Briefly, to go over the toolkit, um, some of this is very technical, so um, I would encourage anybody who's interested to, to go to the Accelerator webpage and take a look at this stuff. Um, we had several different audiences that we were developing toolkit products for. So in brief, uh, the best practices for developing a utility whole building data access solution is a resource for utilities. It takes the best practices by utilities that have gone through this process. It looks at what a utility needs to think about on the IT side, on the cost side, 
uh, in terms of its customer information systems and then in terms of building a bridge to the uh, EPA's Energy Star product. Uh, the second product here, the Stakeholder Engagement Guide, is mostly for municipalities. Uh, what we saw work was cities in a convening role, working with stakeholders from their uh, from local nonprofits, from local foundations in some cases, from the real estate industry, and then also working with their utilities. But um, it really worked when all these parties were at the table. And frankly, it, it didn't work, or we didn't see it work um, when there wasn't a, a kind of strong coalition led by a city. The third is a guide to data access and, and utility customer confidentiality. Confidentiality um, is a big issue that, for utilities in that essentially they're being asked to provide information to a building owner, which is technically a third party to tenant information. So the confidentiality, uh, uh, it, it, it's just been a very significant issue. So we, we use this first resource to document best practices. And Britt, if you can go to the next slide. We also worked with our Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to do a statistical analysis. When a utility starts to wrap up individual meters to aggregate them and send them as a lump number to building owners, how does that impact the quality of information? How does that impact the confidentiality of individual tenant information? So we went through in a very thorough way. We worked with, um, I think, six utilities across the country and something like 120,000 um, different customer accounts uh, to do a, a very scientific study on this. And then last is beyond benchmarking. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. This resource is a discussion on how data access programs can create value for utilities beyond just uh, sort of doing it as a favor um, to their customers or, or this or that. Next slide, Britt. And then to continue that thought, a couple takeaways from the accelerator. Uh, solutions are out there. Um, there are an, a number of utilities that had come up with solutions before our accelerator, and um, that number grew significantly post-accelerator. That said, there are still a lot of challenges, and there's still not a, I think, a, a real clear pathway to scale this, given that uh, 18 or 20 utilities have done this across the country, and there are something like 3,000 utility providers nationwide. Uh, the third thing, and I, I did mention this, um, progress requires local support. So again, we saw uh, solutions where the community was involved in places where the community wasn't involved. Um, we did not see interest um, on the part of the utility, um, and we didn't see a whole lot of progress. And then the fourth is this value question for utilities, um, in that as a utility, often they look at a data access program and they see potential liability, they see potential customer confidentiality issues, they see potential cost, and they don't see real value in it for them. So this is an area that I think as the Department of Energy, we would like to see uh, industry and nonprofits really take a look at because it is something that needs to be addressed uh, if this scales. Next slide, Britt. And then just to close on a related note on some other data work that we have going on at DOE on the city side, our Office of Strategic Programs has had a program running uh, for a little over a year now called Cities Leading Through Energy Analysis and Planning. And the acronym is CLEAP, C-L-E-A-P. Um, the intention there is to really provide some data analysis capability two cities. So there are four things that this program is doing. Um, you can Google C-LEAP and bring this up in more detail. It provided a little more than a million dollars in grants, um, I think principally to three municipal recipients to do some deep dive data analysis work related to energy efficiency. That was last year. It's created a database that's publicly accessible called SLED. That stands for State and Local Energy Database. That brings together a whole bunch of uh, federal, regional, national data sets and enables a city to search by city name or zip code and pull up a whole lot of 
energy energy information estimates um, citywide. This could be transportation sector, this could be building sector, this could be for renewables. Um, so it's, it's really a terrific resource. The third is CLEAP is providing some technical assistance through our National Renewable Energy Lab to a broader set of cities uh, to work on some lower touch energy data analysis issues. And the fourth is that it's now merging in um, really sophisticated real estate data from a company called CoStar that provides this type of inf information to real estate markets um, to help cities that are interested in benchmarking programs and potentially benchmarking requirements get a better handle on its local building stock, how many buildings it has above and below a certain size, what those building uses are, information that has been very hard for municipalities to come by in the past. So I'll stop there and take some questions if we have time. And thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, if, if folks want to type in questions, I don't see any right now, but um, if you do have some questions, go ahead and type those in. We can take one or two before we move on to the next accelerator topic. Um, I would just sort of reiterate what Andrew said. This was a very successful effort in, you know, we we found solutions for the partners we were working with, but as Andrew also noted, there there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this space. And so I think one of the great outcomes of this accelerator was the partnerships he mentioned with the six organizations who are still carrying this work forward. So for the sake of time, I think we're going to go ahead and move to um, Crystal's presentation. But if you have questions, please go ahead and type those in, and we can get them at the end. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, well, we have one last um, set of polls here around outdoor lighting that I am going to um, <clears throat> Try to launch here. Um, and actually, unfortunately, I don't see those coming up. So, Krista, we're, we're a little bit short on time, so I think I'll just go ahead and, and turn this over to you for you to start your presentation. Okay, thank you. That's fine, Monica. Um, uh, thank you again, everyone, for sticking around with us. As you can tell, we have a rich body of work to share with you, as indicated by... Uh, the previous uh, presenters. I will try to move through uh, the slides for the Outdoor Lighting Accelerator Toolkit uh, pretty quickly, uh, given our time here. And the way the slides are organized are um, we will talk a little bit about the Accelerator profile itself, the partners who helped us to achieve the Accelerator outcomes, and then the key focus areas to remove or mitigate barriers, some of our successes, uh, the toolkit and how it is organized, and then, of course, we'll take a quick look inside and then some of the ongoing support and actions around um, street lighting uh, retrofit projects. Uh, Britt, you can move on, please. Thank you. And so the Outdoor Lighting Accelerator was launched in May of 2014, and we actually extended it by an additional six months and concluded the accelerator in December of 2016. We worked to help state and local governments move closer to achieving their uh, clean energy economy using high-performance technologies that reduce the cost of an essential public service, which is street lighting. And the purpose was to collaborate with state and local governments to curate best practices and resources uh, that could be replicated and to help municipalities scale up their system-wide uh, replacement projects. Next slide, please. And so here you have a view of the partners, uh, our participating partners. We work with three states, six regional energy networks, 16 cities, and these partners were very transparent and candid about their retrofit uh, experiences. And while we did set a goal to um, commit 1.5 million lights, we got uh, very close to a commitment of 1.3 million lights to be retrofitted, um, these partners adjusted the scope of their projects and lighting commitments due to the barriers I'll cover today. But we do know that the Outdoor Lighting Accelerator inspired other um, cities and states to action given some recent uh, press release on broad scale projects. Next slide, please. 
So while LED street light technology was gaining greater acceptance in some regions across the country, the market perceptions and barriers still prevented local governments from taking full advantage of the energy savings and cost benefits of uh, LED upgrades primarily. And local governments, as we know, are under tight fiscal constraints, and they are constantly looking for ways to do more with fewer resources. And so with the street lighting costs accounting for up to 60% of a municipality's electric bill, coupled with technology improvements, LEDs were a, a way to offer some fiscal relief for these communities. And we were wondering why more communities weren't doing more with their street lighting. Because street lighting is often considered low-hanging fruit in pursuit of energy goals and, of course, cost savings. But it was still difficult to achieve these retrofits um, in some areas due to street light ownership and maintenance costs, which is the starting point for assessing your retrofit opportunities. Then, of course, the capital costs for upgrades, money is always an issue. The perception of the risk with new technologies. And then, uh, finally, in the regulatory space, we looked at utility tariffs and the outdated tariffs that didn't necessarily incentivize, incentivize efficiency. And there were other things like connection fees um, and unmetered service that pre presented um, some cities from moving forward with their projects. Next slide, please. So after working with uh, these cities and states and regional uh, networks, I appreciate the regional networks because they acted as an aggregator and advocacy group for the smaller um, communities. So um, that was very insightful for us. We did have um, quite a few successes here uh, with the Outdoor Lighting Accelerator. Again, we garnered the commitment of 1.3 million lights to be retrofitted. And then we did make the strategic case for uh, LED street lighting uh, due to partners sharing their data and lessons learned. Uh, we estimated the value of electricity saved to be about $48 million per year. And that is just with uh, our participating partners, which only represented about uh, less than 1% of the street lighting market here in the U.S. We also develop user-friendly resources to assess energy and cost savings opportunities. We worked with our technical partners to update the equipment specifications. And then we opened the conversation with um, utility commissions around the country to understand uh, the conditions slowing the removal of tariff-related barriers to um, scaling up projects. Next slide. This is just a snapshot of the toolkit landing page. So once you get there, you'll know you're in the right place. So I'll, I'll take a little, a little bit of time to talk about the resources and how they are grouped. Next slide. OK, so the resources are grouped by the barrier and the solution designed to address that particular barrier. So for example, here we have um, fin the financial bucket, I'll, I'll call it. Um, these resources were designed to address the obstacles that we list here. Um, there was a need for a quick assessment, a quick kind of e economic feasibility of whether or not to move forward uh, with the street lighting project. Um, there was a need for procurement strategies and then um, partner information to compare price ranges, price ranges uh, for technologies. Because as, we, as the technology improved, we did see a declining cost curve for um, LED streetlights. And again, partners were very transparent about sharing their uh, cost uh, data with us. So we appreciate that. And these are just a few resources. This is not a comprehensive list that I have here uh, for the, the financial category. Uh, next slide, please. And some of the obstacles, as I mentioned before, in the regulatory space was around uh, understanding the LED tariff offerings and the rate making process. Rate making process, you know, um, typically a utility rate, make, rate case may come up every five years. But with the advancement of technology, you know, we were looking at um, examples of whether or not there were some shorter rate cycles, like could a rate case come up every uh, you know, within a two-year period or a three-year period to advance technology, uh, to uh, address technology advancement. Um, so we do have some briefs around that space, discussing it from the perspective of the municipality as well as the perspective of the utility. Um, and then we wanted to look at the buyback options. You know, I mentioned street light ownership being an issue. And some communities were looking at purchasing their street lights or maintaining uh, 
you know, allowing the utility to maintain ownership or a mixed bag. And so we looked at developing a cost comparison tool. So Lauren, we worked with Lawrence Berkeley Lab to, to develop this tool, and that will be posted um, very soon. Next slide, please. And then the final category uh, around a barrier area was around uh, technology and understanding the tech te technology. So we developed some resources to sort of distill the technology. Um, there was an issue with technology standardization, um, how to include controls for connected lighting systems. And then, of course, you know, we had the health and environmental concerns that uh, came up last summer. And so our um, technical experts quickly addressed that. And some of the information, uh, we were able to curate existing resources from uh, the Pacific Northwest National Lab. There's a large body of work around that. And then we also uh, requested that um, some other resources be developed to address the hot topic of the day. For example, the lessons learned from outdoor connected lighting systems uh, installation. So that discusses the value proposition of controls. And I think we have about 12 city examples in that particular webinar, which is archived on the website. And then we provided some blue light guidance around the blue light issues uh, related to dark skies. And some people may call it lighting pollution, et cetera. So all of that information has been uh, compiled and, and placed in the technical category of uh, the toolkit. Next slide, please. This is just a quick insight look of a few of the pages. I'm especially proud of the partner profiles. As I mentioned, they were very transparent with us. And we, so we tried to cap capture a synopsis of their experiences. And then we also did hyperlinks to any uh, resources or uh, media that is related to their particular project. Then we looked at the general concerns and tried to categorize um, their experiences. So if you are uh, interested in a retrofit project, you can look at this uh, the, the page that says, this is how they did it, Pathways to Energy Savings with Streetlights. You can look at the scenario, see if you identify with the scenario, and then there's a corresponding uh, link to the partner's profile that went through um, and a similar experience. So uh, we do have quite a few reports. Uh, I've listed two reports here developed by DOE staff, but we also work with our regional energy efficiency uh, organizations, our partners there, to develop more localized resources. We have issue briefs. Um, cost comparison tools, updated model specifications for LED roadway uh, luminaires. I also mentioned the, the webinars. And then uh, additional projects uh, created by all our other uh, stakeholder and partner groups. Next slide, please. One of the more popular tools, tools on the, uh, the toolkit is the Outdoor Lighting Decision Tree Tool. This is where we curated existing resources from partners and stakeholder groups. And then we also created new resources where um, there were gaps in information. And this is essentially an interactive visual representation of the decisions that need to be made when you're upgrading your public outdoor lighting system. It follows a, a typical project life cycle for uh, streetlight uh, retrofit projects. And so you can take a path depending on where you are in the process and click on uh, the decision node, the, the square box there, which is populated with um, a lot of the resources um, that I just referenced. Next slide. Our ongoing support around this issue uh, will be uh, continuing under the Municipal Solid State Street Lighting Consortium uh, that is still active. You can go to the, uh, the consortium's webpage uh, for more enrollment information and contact information on the energy.gov website, or you can just contact me directly, and I'll put you directly in touch with uh, the Street Light Consortium uh, staff. Next slide, please. I just wanted to capture some next steps and opportunities around outdoor lighting to let you know we're not dropping the ball on this issue just because the accelerator um, has been completed, but we are continuing to monitor pro progress, uh, communicate the benefits, and then we're continuing to collaborate with our partners and stakeholder groups to, uh, to promote successful um, opportunities and, and replicable um, solutions for other cities to follow. Next slide. 
wanted to be sure to include links to the different portals that we have available with a, a lot of, like I said, re rich resources on, on street lighting and other outdoor lighting applications, along with my direct contact information should you have uh, any uh, particular questions. And um, I think I did that <laughs> in record time. So with that, I'm going to hand the mic back over to Monica. And again, I thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, sorry for shutting, cutting you a little bit short there on time. I just wanted to note, as, as uh, Crystal mentioned, that the outdoor lighting decision tree has actually been consistently, all through 2016, one of the top tools um, on the Dewey Better Building Solution Center. So definitely encourage you to, to check out that uh, resource as well as the rest of the toolkit. Um, we are running a little bit late on time here. I apologize for that. Um, you know, if, if folks are able to stay on, I think we will go through a few questions now, um, and then we'll conclude this webinar. So I think I'm going to just pull up here two or three questions, and then we will commit to getting back to those who we weren't able to answer questions, or you can directly email uh, the presenters um, as well. Um, so here is a question for Andrew um, around the CLEAP. Uh, information that you provided with the CDF and NREL technical assistance regarding area building stock work with the county. Uh, my understanding is yes. Great. Um, there's a clear distinction between the internal government operations and the broader community facing work to drive energy consumption and emissions reduction. Um, I guess this is just a note um, and then it's followed up here with a question. Um, does the TA that's available help um, intentionalize and or bridge um, a city's interest in dri driving both its internal and community facing energy related goals? Do you know the answer to that, Andrew? I think there's flexibility um, to meet data analysis needs for communities. So that could be um, government or municipal or county operations or it could be um, like community energy planning. Okay. Um, and then, Andrew, your last question. Um, do you know if the resources and energy data toolkit translate to affordable multifamily housing providers? I don't quite know how to answer. I, I think yes, um, with the exception of maybe federally subsidized housing. Um, so it, it depends on what what's meant by affordable housing. Um, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, um, pays energy costs for the federal subsidized portfolio. So it works a little bit differently there. Yeah, and wasn't HUD a, a partner actually with uh, and actively engaged in a lot of your work with the Energy Data Toolkit? Um, yes, HUD was, um, HUD, has, HUD has been very interested in this to reduce um, the federal energy expense, um, which runs into the billions for the subsidized portfolio. So um, former Secretary Castro wrote a letter to several hundred um, CEOs of investor-owned utilities. This was before he left office, um, asking if there was a way for HUD to work with those utilities um, to help um, provide more information to HUD that would enable it to reduce some of those costs. So. Um, at least under prior leadership, this was an issue, a big issue for HUD. Okay. Great. And um, Leslie, I hope that addresses your question. And the last question we'll take is actually for Crystal. Um, Crystal, do you know the overall potential for outdoor lighting? Um, as you noted, many think the market is saturated. Um, the the uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs did a, an inventory. They're actually... A, I think they're completing part two of that inventory to do a national inventory on street lighting. I think we're somewhere around 40 to 45 million street lights in the U.S. I don't have that number uh, in front of me. And I think we're far from being saturated um, just based on our experiences and conversations with partners through the accelerator and, and talking to other municipalities that are not necessarily um, partners in the accelerate. But yes, yeah, so I think there's still a huge market potential out there. Okay, great. So um, with that, I think just for, because we are running over, we'll go ahead 
and move to the last slide here. Um, but if you have any additional questions, please feel free to follow up uh, directly with, uh, you know, to the presenters. We have here a link to the toolkits. I hope you guys are able to visit those. If you sw switch to the next slide, Britt, I think we have um, just a note here that we'll have our next webinar July 27th from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, the focus will be on wireless technology and um, how the company Maison met the specif specifications set forth by the low-cost wireless metering challenge. So please join us for that if you are able to. Um, and I think we'll end, Britt, with the list of our panelists for people to follow up with. Just want to thank um, Alice, Andrew, and Crystal very much for taking the time to share this information with us today. Please feel free to, to directly contact them or you can directly contact me if you're interested in any of the other accelerators we weren't able to talk about today. So, um, and I will close with the fact that we will, you will receive an email notice with the archive of this session, so with the slides and the recording once it's available online. So thanks again and for sticking around here 10 minutes late. Um, thank you for your time and have a great afternoon. <laughs>